Good morning, everybody. You know, I wonder what your relationship to meditation is. You know, how do you feel about it? I, I can explore how I feel about it. <clears throat> now, just to open up a territory, maybe, you know, maybe you feel excited about it. You know, you uh, have heard, in particular if you're new, you know, you've heard that it's really helpful to calm the mind, you know, help you with concentration, uh, make you a more composed, compassionate human being, warm-hearted. And there's research to prove it. So then you get really interested. It's like, how do I do it? You know, what's the right approach? Do I do it this way? Do I do it that way? You experiment. <laughs> um, and generally, you're optimistic that it will deliver these results. You know, like that. And then on the other hand, maybe particularly when you've practiced for a while, you might be a little bit disillusioned about the whole thing. It's like, geez, I, my body is still kind of achy. It's like, you know, these certain pains I have don't go away. The emotional patterns that I thought would dissolve keep showing up. Um, and generally speaking, you know, it's like not much is happening. It's a little boring on top of it. And um, maybe it's just a waste of time because there are these real world problems and while I'm sitting on the cushion, nothing gets done about those issues. You know, maybe I should spend my time focusing on a particular issue in the world and solve a problem instead of sitting quietly doing nothing. You know, like that. Maybe it's both. Maybe, you know, maybe you haven't, you're not completely disillusioned, but at the same time you have some doubts. Maybe that's the most common place to be in. <clears throat> now, what I find interesting when you, again, it's just contrasting some attitudes. Um, I think they are manifestations of the same mental posture. And it's, uh, you know, the expectation that meditation is a means to an end, that it will deliver a result. So you can be excited about that promise, or you can be disappointed when it doesn't come. So what if we try out a different mental posture and say, you know, meditation doesn't solve any problems at all. This is where, you know, you get frustrated. Meditation isn't good for anything, so why should I do it? <laughs> so what if meditation actually isn't about delivering solutions? It's not about delivering results. It doesn't solve any problems. It does have, and I'd like to talk about that today, it does have the capacity to change our relationship to problems. It's like you can learn to be very willing to have problems. And that's a different kind of solution. And that doesn't mean we're kind of like, oh, we're willing to have the problems and so we ignore them. It's more like we're willing to have the problems and become actually more realistic about what it means to solve problems.
Now, if you are sitting down right now to meditate, and you, you kind of do when you are in this posture already, in a way. But anyway, we'll just kind of like, okay, you sit down to meditate, what, do you, what are you doing? You're arranging your lower body in a way that allows you to support an upright spine. And there are different ways to do it. But most of all, it's kind of like a craft to find out for ourselves what that means. Like, how can I sit in a way that allows me to invite the spine into uprightness? Now, the way I see it is that the body... How can I say this? <clears throat> There's a certain alignment that the body can have that allows for effortlessness. So if we simplify that is and, and work with the spine, if the spine is correct correctly held or stacked, then the body can relax around it. Now, if you're an athlete, you have to learn to align, let the body be aligned in some ways so that a kind of higher functionality can emerge that doesn't emerge if it's not aligned, something like that. So when we, when we put ourselves into this posture, it's like we are inviting that alignment At any moment in time, again, I'm just presenting a view that I have from my own practice and, of course, from teachings and stuff, but it could be different. <clears throat> at, any, at any moment in time, my body, our bodies, I assume, I don't want to speak for you, but you understand, like, it's just a view that, to try out. Our bodies express what's going on with us physiologically, emotionally, and mentally. I had this idea for a long time. I'm recognizing it now that I have uh, uh, almost 10 months old baby boy, you know. I had, I had this idea that we are born with a certain kind of perfection, you know? Like something unencumbered is there when we're born. Like some form of alignment that later gets compromised. But my baby boy, my baby boy, am I? Well, he... Um, was born with a torticollis, you know, it's like, basically that's a medical term for like a stiff neck, you know, or this. When you wake up in the morning <laughs> and you kind of didn't sleep well on your pillow or something, you wake up with torticollis. So he was born that way. It's like, that's not perfect. And it just happened so that, you know, I don't know, in the pillow of the womb, you know, he didn't find the right position. So we're helping him. He's got physical therapy and a speech therapist and, you know, osteopathy. <laughs> That's great. Um, so he's fine. It's getting better all the time. But anyway, it sort of made me realize that I held a view like this and now I'm realizing, no, from the beginning, there's just problems. <laughs> I have some stories about my birth, and it wasn't perfect. And so is everybody, you know? And then so, some situations are much more challenging than others. You know, when your babies are born with a genetic disease or with, you know... Um, 
all kinds of malfunctioning parts of the body, etc. So this perfection that we're seeking, that we're desiring, actually, I think, doesn't exist from the beginning. Some of us are just a little bit more fortunate than others, or, or a lot. Now, emotionally, now, you know, then you have this body, and it is placed in the world and in an environment with parents and social circumstances and etc. You can fill in the blanks. All the causes and conditions of life. And then certain ways that we relate to those causes and conditions and create certain patterns, emotional patterns. And they become kind of chronic. You know? <clears throat> well, that's also represented in our body. Muscular tensions and you know, certain ways we are twisting away from stuff leaning into it. <clears throat> and then mentally, you know, if you have chronic thoughts, I just made that up, chronic thoughts, uh, you know, I think sometimes a chronic thought turns into a worldview or something. If you have a thought over and over again, then it becomes a view, and then that view is actually framing the way you approach the world. <clears throat> That also is represented in the body, expressed through it. So, meditation, you know, arranging the lower body to invite the spine into uprightness, you're inviting all of this stuff into your attentional sphere. So rather than like fixing a problem, you're inviting all your, let me put it that way, all your misalignments. Who wants to do that? Well, we want to. And then we have this issue that, you know, meditation isn't just bliss and solving problems. It is actually inviting discomfort, difficulty, and in a way, the reality of our existence. So, it's like, are you up for that? Are you up for inviting the reality of your existence? <clears throat> and is there, is that, you know, at some, there's a point in our lives, you know, different for each of us, where we might feel like, oh, it's better to invite the reality of our existence than to try to push it away, or to... Um, run after fixing it. So every time I sit down, I rock myself into uprightness. Either you really do it or you kind of feel it inside. This comes. But it doesn't come as clear information, like, you know, somebody's showing you a video about, this is what's going on with you. Just, you know, learn about it. It's more like it comes as this, I don't know, it's just a feeling. It's just, it's all, I, again, this is my view. The information is all there, but not... not sorted out yet. It's coming all at once. So, um, in addition to the physical posture, what are you doing? 
when you sit down to meditate, you work with attention. And the instruction is something like, when you notice that your attention is glued to, as I like to say, or entangled with, wrapped up in, stuck in, your ongoing thoughts, your discursive thinking process. You take it and you bring it to breath, body, and phenomena. Now, I'm saying breath, body, and phenomena, a phrase I learned from my teacher. And it's, it's, I'm bringing it up today because it sort of like hit me, oh, you know, breath, body, and phenomena. What's, um, what's underlying these three words really is sensation. You take, and you start with the breath because it's like, it's almost in all the traditions that instruct meditation, you know, you kind of start with the breath. Um, it's kind of a non-controversial approach. <laughs> Maybe the only one. Um, you notice that attention is glued to your thinking process. Why is another kind of interesting question, but I'm sidestepping it right now. And so you work with that and you bring attention to breathing. Well, I say this often, often, often. It's like, what are you really bringing attention to when you're bringing attention to the breath? You bring attention to the sensations of breathing because breathing manifests as the sensations of breathing in the body. It, you know, I bring attention to how it feels that the body is expanding and contracting through the breath. And, and if, you, if you practice breathing in this way through being clear that you're attending to the sensations of breathing, then through breathing you start to attend to all the sensations of the body because breath isn't just limited to the lungs, it kind of penetrates into the whole body. Physiologically it does through oxygen, but also um, perceptually for us. You know, I can breathe into my leg. Whatever that means, it makes sense as an experience. So with the breath, attention can travel into the leg or it can travel into the arm or into, you know, the neck, the ears. I'm just doing that right now. Ah, oh, ears. You can, you can feel the body from the inside, so to speak. Okay, so, so the sensations of breath, the sensations of body, and then phenomena, bringing attention to phenomena. So I look into the scene, you know, what am I seeing? There's color, form, shapes, you know, when I listen, there's sound. I call this also sensation. So, instead of having attention wrapped up in your thinking process, we can learn to bring it to the sensations of breath, body, and the phenomenal world. Why would we do that? What's important about it? You know, sometimes when you, it's a kind of a simplified version of Zen practice, you sort of think, you, you've, you take the instructions to be that thought is something bad and needs to be avoided. But obviously that's just not the case. <clears throat> As human beings, we need uh, our thinking all the time. I mean, I'm using it right now to convey something to you, and if you want to solve a problem, you're going to have to think about it. <clears throat> But there's something we should recognize, right? So it, there's this 
famous saying that, oh, let me put it this way. You know, we make a, we can make a mental map of the world with our thinking. Let's just put it that way. I don't know if it's philosophically sound, but you understand. You make a mental map of the world. And as the saying goes, the map is not the territory. Some Polish linguist said that, and I can never remember his name. Starts with a K, but you know, Polish names, as Aga knows, for us non-Polish people are impossible to pronounce. Say, so anyway, <clears throat> Krzybski or something like that. The map is not the territory. So when we have thoughts about the world, <clears throat> about our life, about problems, anything, right? The tendency is to believe those thoughts, to take them as, to not know that the map is not the territory, but to confuse the map with the territory and say, like, this is how it is, this is what the world is. You know, if you have chronic thoughts, <laughs> you, really, you really start to believe them. And I think we, we believe our thoughts in ways that we don't even notice. <clears throat> It happens to me sometimes it's like, oh shit, you know, I've I've been practicing for quite a while and I know how to talk about it and then I realize, oh I actually believe this. <clears throat> okay, so it happens all the time. So you can ask yourself and in a very simplified way is, you know, do what, what how do you want to ground your life? You want to ground your life in thought? in the map, or do you want to ground your life in the territory? So when, you, when we bring attention to breath, body, and phenomena, we're opening up the world to appear to us fresh again. It's disturbing because, as I said about the body, when you sit with an upright spine and your life comes with everything, you don't understand. When you look at the world outside of thought, just, you know, with sensation, you don't understand anything. It's disturbing. We want to understand. If you don't understand, you're not in control. So you want to understand. So actually, letting go of thought means you let go of control and you, you're just sitting in the midst of your problems, let's say, or you're sitting in the midst of the world and it's, complexity and mystery. This is quite disturbing, actually. It's also, it can also be blissful at the same time, because, you know, all these problems that we've actually created with our thoughts are kind of gone. And at the same time, it feels like now I don't know what to do at all. I've mentioned this to you, or some of you, before. It's like one of the most telling experiences I had about this was I was sitting zazen, and then I got up, and it felt like I didn't know how to walk anymore. You know, we sit, and then we do walking meditation. It felt like, so now how do I do this? Yeah, it's disturbing. It sounds like an exaggeration right now when I tell the story, but it felt like, I don't know, some pattern had let go of like my normal way of walking and it felt unfamiliar. <clears throat> when you allow this, and I don't mean this in a philosophical way, although it's fun to make it philosophical too. It's like reality comes into question, you know, what is, what's reality? Is reality the map that we're making with our thoughts? And or is reality the territory that we enter when we, when we attend to sensation without thinking about it? Or maybe reality is even much more mysterious in the sense that even 
the sensations that come to us through the senses and it's like that's just the way a human being sees the world or reality because if you are a bat you know it's different <clears throat> There's this famous essay, and so I'm saying bat, you know, what is it like to be a bat? <clears throat> Which we can't know. So what, what, I, what I just want to point to is, like, by releasing thought and maybe even questioning sensation, we are exposing ourselves to the mystery of reality. And it's like, it can come to us afresh. It's a release from something fixed. <clears throat> it, in my last talk, I quoted Suzuki Rashi, who said, When you become you, Zen becomes Zen. When you are you, you become one with your surroundings. And I, I pointed out that, you know, there's something strange about this quote. That's why it's intriguing. But it's like when you become you indicates that we can be ourselves without really being ourselves. Like we can be alienated from ourselves and we actually have to become ourselves. How do you make sense of this? Well, I said, you know, the, the discursive thinking that creates our narrative self, that's a certain kind of you. That's the you that is living with the map that is being made. And then there is this other you, which is maybe what I've pointed to all through this talk. It's like a you that is releasing itself from this map and opens up into the mystery of reality. When you become you, Zen becomes Zen. When you are you, you become one with your surroundings. Now, I don't know, is that some mystical experience? Like, becoming one with our surroundings? <clears throat> no separation, non-dual. Yeah, it... it can be that way sometimes, I think. No, I know. I remember when I started practicing in San Francisco, I had this favorite restaurant, cafe to go to, you know. It was called Crepes on Coal. And I would go there often. <clears throat> and eat crepes on coal. But I really like their potatoes. So I had this kind of mystical experience there. I was reading something and uh, and then it felt like the whole cafe was not an outside but an inside. And there was a warmth in the space with all the people there, and they felt very close. <clears throat> Not other. <laughs> when, I, when I reported this at one point, early in my practice to my teacher, he said, oh, you were just, you know, kind of emotionally open. And I felt like, really? <laughs> seems so significant. <clears throat> anyway, if I give it the benefit of the doubt, he just didn't want me to get attached to this experience. <clears throat> but you know, now actually, the way I see it is, is less excited about like, oh, you know, something changed in my way of being in the world, more like, um, when I look into the scene, 
sometimes I forget, but when I look into the scene, I realize this is where I am right now. There's no getting away from this. You can walk out the door, but then I'm there. <clears throat> so being one with the surrounding, it's, it's like being willing to accept the way the world presents itself right now. Instead of fighting it or... Now, I think the fantasy is then, oh, maybe then everything is harmonious. But no, it's like the world also comes with its conflicts and problems. You know, like I said, maybe meditation can open us to being, change our relationship to the problems, like being willing to have our problems. So today I want to add to the quote uh, because the Sukhirashi also says in this particular chapter, he says, when you are you, Zazen becomes true Zazen. <clears throat> zazen becomes true Zazen. When you practice Zazen, your problem will practice Zazen. And everything else will practice zazen too. When you practice zazen, your problem will practice zazen. He also says there, you know, somewhere, actually, he says, actually, just to be alive is to have problems. No, in problem-solving theory, yes, such a thing exists. Um, you can make a distinction between puzzles and problems. And puzzles are puzzles are problems. As a, puzzles are a kind of problem that have a defined solution. The, the solution to a puzzle is either right or wrong. And all you need to, fi to find the right solution is all the available information. If you have all the inv available information, you can solve the puzzle. Like test questions or puzzles. If you have the information, you can give the right answer. But our real-life problems, our real-world problems, are not puzzles. Um, maybe that's actually why people solve puzzles as a relaxation, you know? Like, because you can trust that this problem that you give yourself by trying to solve a puzzle actually has a solution. It's like, it's so, it's so defined. It's relaxing, because life is not that way. I don't know. I, I just I don't find this just amusing. I find it. This is this is very. This can change a view. It's like, because, you know, we live in this pandemic. The other day, I realized, wow, it's starting to really annoy me. <clears throat> I've been there. There's been so much change in my life. You know that. Uh, I that won't go into the story, but it's like it was great. It's like pandemic. It gave me space to write a book, and with the help of some of you here in this room, you know, come here, renovate the space, the center. It was great. Nobody was disturbing us. We had all the time in the world. And so now I feel like, geez, it'd be nice if you know people could could come. <clears throat> Now I know this is this is very unique to me and I know that other people have been bothered by the pandemic for good reasons much more than I have. <clears throat> but anyway, I had finally had this like
But a pandemic is not a puzzle. But I find it remarkable how much people are trying to talk about it as if it was a puzzle. As if there were these solutions that we could just have and fix the pandemic. And if somebody, you know, the president, the government, doesn't fix the problem, then we have a right to be in, incensed about it. But I think this is misunderstanding the problem as a puzzle. Well, the other term that I find very interesting is there are so-called wicked problems. This is a technical term. Wicked problems. Wicked problems are problems that are not defined enough to allow a solution. <laughs> they often don't have solutions, or if there are solutions, they are not right or wrong, they're only better or worse. And when you start solving a wicked problem, you know, you realize that this problem is just a symptom of other problems, and you don't know where to start. If you want to solve this problem, you have, it feels like you have to solve all problems in the world. And the biggest problems are like that. Global warming, poverty, social injustice, they can't be fixed. As I like to say, they can only be lived. How do you live these problems? And this is like, and this is where meditation can help, I think. It's like this willingness, as I've just talked about in various ways, this willingness to have them is the first step. And then, a kind of ongoing renewal of relating to the problems. Because wicked problems don't have solutions, all you can do is live them with a step. Like, you'll take one step, and then the problem already presents itself. It's not solved, it just presents itself differently than from there. And then, it's like, we need to take another step. So to be willing to be in this process of just taking steps with our problems. This is maybe not a solution, but a kind of inner... <clears throat> a certain inner posture in which something can... feel more rested, less upset. Life is a wicked problem. Thank you very much. <laughs>